Okay, uh, our next speaker, Trish McMillan Law, does need no further introduction. She's a legend and she's going to talk about the hand that feeds you, working with rescue, resource guarding in shelter dogs. All right, is everybody awake? We're on the home stretch. Got two more pre presentations. This one's gonna be really dramatic. There's gonna be lots of videos, snarling dogs, wake you up. Um, before I get started, how many of you test for resource guarding when you bring dogs in with the little fake hand and the food bowl? That's pretty consistent with the United States. Almost all shelters test for it. How many of them, how many of you make euthanasia decisions based on that test? Not so many. How, how many of you do rehab around resource guarding if you get, cool. Excellent. If, if you are a shelter that has the capacity to do rehabilitation or you're just going to start doing it, this is probably the problem to start with. There are a lot of things you can do that are pretty easy to implement and it is one of the more uh, workable behavior problems. So let's talk about guarding. Why do dogs guard? Well, when you've got that group of wolves around, oh, dingoes around the carcass, <laughs> The dingo who's sitting at the back going, okay, you lot, go ahead, eat the deer. Nope, kangaroo. He was the one who didn't reproduce. So it's very adaptive for animals to guard what they are eating. It's very normal even still between conspecifics. If you've got two dogs that you feed side by side and they're grumbling over their food, that's very normal. Stop feeding them side by side. It's much more problematic when it's directed towards humans, however, not all dogs guard as fiercely towards humans. I'm gonna focus on dogs guarding towards humans because that's what we test for in shelters and it's a little easier to work with. Guarding things that are not food, if I have time I'll talk a little bit about how to work with dogs who guard things that are not food, that's a little bit harder. And what we need to look at is the, how many triggers there are for that aggression around possession. So we'll, this is the overview of the talk. We're gonna talk about what guarding looks like, uh, a little bit of the research that's been done around food guarding and shelter dogs. We're gonna talk about working with food guarders and then hopefully we'll have time to talk about dogs who guard other things. So what does it look like? The, the signs that a dog is gonna guard a possession or a food bowl is a little bit subtle at first. So this is, the hard eye is your first indication that the dog is starting to get uncomfortable. You start seeing the little half moon. Um, I understand it's called whale eye here too. You can also notice the pupil may start dilating if the dog is guarding something. You could see the tension around the eye, the hard stare. The body will stiffen up. Those are all signs that the dog is starting to guard and they're very subtle. If you're not a dog behavior person, you might not notice that. The, whenever I hear the dog suddenly and without warning bit somebody, I would bet money if someone had a video, <laughs> there was a nice long freeze beforehand. Now if you're watching your dogs, one of them might be chewing on something, another dog might walk by, watch carefully for this, the dog who's chewing might stop. And that dog who's walking by will go, whoa, I'm terribly sorry, they'll back away, they know that is a back off signal. However, toddlers do not recognize this. Adult humans often don't recognize this. And I'll show you an example in video of a really nice dramatic freeze in a bit. This is the point where most normal people notice that there's something wrong. The lip retracts. My friend Catherine's lovely Kelpie. Um, you can see how huge the pupils are. They're taking up that dog's whole eye almost, that glassy reflection in the back. The face is really tense. I would bet that body is hard as a rock while she's guarding her rawhide. And then you get to the snap bite. That's my arm. I'll show you the scar later. And that was a resource guarder and me being stupid. So how common is resource guarding? It seems that when you look at um, shelter dogs, it's pretty consistent around 15% of them will show this behavior on intake in certain breeds, it's a little more common. I, I don't know about here, but I've noticed a lot of your black and tan guarding type breeds, such as my dear Doberman. 
um, Rotties, Spaniels, there are certain dogs that tend to do this a little bit more than others. So that I believe there's a genetic component to it, but that does not mean it's not fixable. So a little bit of research that's been done in the United States. This is one of the most frequently assessed things. If you're only going to do one thing in the shelter, this is something that's very easy to assess. Everybody recognizes the famous Sue Sternberg assess a hand. Every shelter has one or a reasonable facsimile. Um, however, th what's recently been looked at is how common it is to have a false positive, to have a dog who shows aggression on the assessment who would not show it in the home. And there's also a little bit of data around false negatives, a dog that you can, who isn't interested in the food or you can push out of the food in the shelter who goes into a home and begins guarding. A lot of shelters will euthanize, at least in the States, it will euthanize if the dog shows any aggression whatsoever around the food bowl. So it's wise to have some idea what the, um, the false positive rate is. And here are some of the stats from Emily Weiss study on, uh, it was a, just a survey on how many of the shelters in the States assessed. So 92% assessed for food aggression. Of that, only a third attempted behavior modification and half of them, if you got a growl or snap or anything around the food bowl, didn't even attempt to offer the dog for adoption. But half of them said they do have some resources for behavior modification. So I'm going to rant a little bit. Thank you, Doberman. That's a submissive grin. She's not upset. Um, if, you're in, if you're in a shelter and you're a shelter dog, food becomes way more important than it is at home. Some shelters only feed once a day. That makes it even more important. I am not a smoker, but if you put me in jail, I might start getting interested in cigarettes because that's the, <laughs> the currency. So you may get things from a shelter dog that you would not see. And the rate of false positives is alarmingly high. I'm going to continue ranting <laughs> about the use of the assessor hand. When I just randomly get on the internet and look up food guarding, I see some really inappropriate uses of this hand. I want you to think about I'm going to show you a video and a little bit of this lovely Doberman. Always the Doberman's getting the bad press. Um, I will show you some inappropriate use of the assessor hand and think about would you do this if it was your real hand? Would an adopter push the dog this hard if it was their real hand? Look at that face. <laughs> would you be doing that with your real hand? So things to think about and to standardize with your shelter is how many times are you going to approach the bowl? Are you just touching the bowl as an adopter might? Are you touching the dog as an adopter might? How many times are you going to do it? And think about when you're going to stop. It's really tempting when you've got a fake hand and you are the assessor and you are always right because every dog that you euthanize doesn't bite anyone <laughs> and it gives you a false sense of grandeur, I think. It's really tempting to just say, well, I think I saw something on that fourth approach. Let's just try one more. And it's something that no one in their right mind would go up to that dog a second time <laughs> when she's done that face. And um, again, they're in a shelter. So I, I think we're getting more false positives because we are using that hand in a way that we wouldn't if it was our hand. So in, I am trained in the safer assessment and we do one pull away. We do one touch to each side of the dog's face. And as soon as the dog shows any sign of aggression, a freeze, a growl, a hunkering over, you stop. You have the information you need. That dog is uncomfortable around the food bowl put them on a food bowl program, and you don't have to have that bite to the assessor hand on record. It, you, as soon as you see the dog is uncomfortable, stop. So the ASPCA went on and did some research. This is the same study I spoke about earlier with Heather Moen Gibbons and um, Emily Weiss. They went to Wisconsin Humane. They took 96 dogs who had shown food guarding on assessment. There were some restrictions. They did not they, they accepted dogs who stiffened, who growled, who bit the hand. They did not look at dogs who were under six months. They were excluded from the program. They didn't take dogs into it who placed their body between the assessor and the bowl. They didn't take dogs that did multiple bites up the fake hand. 
and the shelter also requested that no pit bulls or rotties were put into the experiment. So it is, it is a different group than your whole shelter dogs. But they did regular enrichment stuff around the shelter, but they did not do any specific treatment in the shelter for this problem. They sent the dog home with the, they did pre-feed the dog, but they did not, um, they did not do any of the exercises I'm going to show you in a bit. So the pre-feeding is you put a big bowl of food in the kennel and the dog can eat all they want. Um, a lot of the times it's, it's hunger based. I had a friend whose large blue puppy started suddenly guarding and when she came to class, I could feel every rib. He was just going through a growth spurt that he was hairy and she didn't know. So that will take hunger out of the equation and a lot of them just stop. So in this study, they sent the doctors home with, they had to sign a waiver saying, we recognize this dog has shown food guarding. They were told to continue free feeding the dog, better a fat dog than a dead dog. They were asked to get the dog to sit for the food bowl. Um, and they weren't given any specific behavior modification beyond that. So the client compliance on all of the stuff, don't mess with the dog with the food bowl, free feed the dog, there, it was crappy. It was really not great client compliance. But despite that, they only saw 6% of the dogs in the home reporting guarding in the first three weeks. There was one case of rawhide guarding at three months, um, only one around food. And the interesting thing to me, Despite the fact that nobody did what they were supposed to, there was very little guarding. And the return rate at that shelter was 9%. The return rate with the dogs who were sent home with the waiver and the plan and the knowledge that he'd shown aggression in the shelter was 5%. So figure that out. Another really cool study was done by the Center for Shelter Dogs. I'm going to pop the name of the journal up there in case anybody wants to look up the... Um, look up the original research, but it was, it was also really interesting. She, they did no behavior modification in the shelter again. All of the food aggressive dogs got pre-adoption counseling recommending the adopt owners avoid bothering the dog while eating. And they found that, and they didn't have the restrictions. They found that a little bit over half the dogs that were uh, food aggressive on the behavior evaluation showed it in the home but half of them did not show it at all, despite no behavior modification, not all of the restrictions of the previous study. Um, so, but they also looked at the ones who didn't show food aggression on the assessment and found that 78% who did not show food aggression in the shelter um, did not show food aggression in the home, but 22% of the ones that didn't show it in the shelter did show it in the home. So that's the false negative rate. Those are the ones you're not catching. But Almost all of the adopters with dogs who showed food aggression did not consider it a problem. Um, a lot of them didn't even consider their dog to be food aggressive. If you, they didn't check the box, but if you ask, does he growl around your food? Oh yeah, oh yeah, but he's not food aggressive. So there's a, finally we're getting some science around this stuff. It's very interesting. So if you are going to treat food guarding, and some of this goes into that 22% who go home and we don't know about it and they call us up and say, I've got a food guard or what do I do? Uh, some of this, if you do want to do some behavior modification in the shelter beyond pre-feeding, here's a few things that you can, you can throw at it. If it's an adopter calling, management is usually my number one go-to with food guarding, especially if it's towards other dogs. If they're only guarding the food bowl only at dinner time, what a door between those dogs. They do not have to eat with their bowls touching. It's amazing how many people feed the dogs really close together. We'll go into some classical conditioning approaches and then some operant conditioning approaches. So here's how dogs eat at my house. One of them in the kitchen, one of them in the bathroom, one of them in the living room <laughs> with baby gates between them. We do not have any issues around food. Here's the desensitization and counter conditioning model. If you think about Pavlov and the bell, if the bell rings and then the food comes, the bell rings, the food comes after a while, the dog hears the bell ring and they can't help but anticipate food is coming. So some of the old school ways we were taught to work with resource guarding was 
the dog's guarding, you need to go up and show them who's boss and take that food away. And what you're doing then is you're teaching the dog, yeah, they do want my stuff. I'd better guard it a little bit harder. So the classical conditioning approach is much easier to do and uh, works better. So I'll, I'll show this in video. You approach the bowl, you can see my friend is dropping food. Oh, let me show you what it looks like in the slide. You can drop food into the bowl, just walk up, drop some wet food in, walk up, drop a piece of chicken in, or you can hand the dog the food. And I think this is better for some dogs because they're disengaging from the bowl and engaging with you, but at the, you're still walking up. So the approach is predicting dessert and not the approach predicting they want my stuff. That's the key to the classical conditioning approach. Let's see if the video works. multiply that by 10 during a meal and pretty soon you're getting a dog who is looking up happily rather than hunkering over. And I'm just giving him a treat that's, that's better than his food, so that's enough for him to look up. Once they get that and they're stopping and looking up and going, yippee, it's time for dessert, you can start adding food to the bowl. If I was working with a shelter dog and I didn't know the dog very well, I might add a tether. And you'll see how that looks in the shelter dog video. And if I really want to finish the job off well before the dog goes home or really want to prove that there are people in the home who might touch the dog while they're eating, I'll go in, touch the dog, add something better to the food, and walk away. So I, this, this particular dog is, I'm touching her collar. So I touch backs and necks and collar. And if I really want to be um, thorough, I'll, I'll add touch the face and then add some food. That's advanced. It's important to proof. This is yet another of my darling Dobermans, and that is what a deer leg looks like that they find <laughs> in North America. You like to find them on hikes and just carry them ahead, lie down, chew on it, wait till I caught up, carry it ahead. <laughs> this is something that if you've got a resource guarder, maybe the, the adopter did not anticipate. So proofing is where you get the behavior to work in circumstances other than just in my kitchen with the food bowl. So it's important to proof to new er new people, new areas, found or dropped food, and here I guess it would be kangaroo legs. So he, <laughs> possums, there's all kind, yeah. The w everywhere has their wildlife, so dogs will find. So here's, here's the pro tip. The, the trouble with most people doing a classical counter conditioning plan is that they go way too fast. Okay, I walked up twice, the dog didn't bite me, I'm gonna go for the bowl next. There is no downside to taking this work much slower than you think you need to. What you need to watch for is that happy response. So the first time I walked up to my little pit bull, he was he was not accustomed to this program. He's not a food guarder. I just needed a video <laughs> for this. So he, he was not happy. He just looked up, went, okay, there's a cookie, thank you, and went back to it. Um, if he was guarding that food, I would want to wait until he's looking up before I even get to the bowl, and he's wagging and happy, and you've got chicken, and I've just got kibble. And if I wait to that stage before I go on to touching the bowl or picking the bowl up or touching him, it, the program will actually go faster than it will if I blast through it too quickly. So um, go slow to go fast is kind of the mantra for classical conditioning. There's no downside. And make sure that you're watching for those body language cues. If he's looking up but he's giving you a hard eye or if he's looking up and, and then freezing, you're not ready to go to the next stage. You need to stay where you are. So I've got a really cool case study. Guess what kind of dog? This is a dog who was, her owner got older and older. She was put in a home and the neighbors came and fed the dog. She lived, I think, mainly in the garage for the last three years. The owner finally died and she's, he's a beautiful blue Doberman. I've never seen a nine-year-old blue with this much coat. Um, she came with nine years of vet record. She'd been very well loved. She'd been taken to the nursing home, but she'd been kind of neglected in this garage. She was taken to the shelter they did an assessment that didn't go well, and we will go 
go over what's happened from there. So I'd like you to watch the assessment, think, remembering what I told you about where to stop. And I like all of you to shout out where you would stop. Just yeah, I know it's you're Australians. It's a big group. It's hard to yell things out. But my shelter peeps who were at my at my uh, workshop, tell me where you would stop. Just yell out stop. <laughs> that's ex that's exactly what happened. But you're getting you're getting ahead of it. <laughs> Yeah, there we go. <laughs> so um, I did some re-coaching with the assessor on how to do the assessment correctly. But they sent me this video, so you're a Doberman person, you foster for our shelter, look how beautiful she is, here's her sad story. Um, can you come and meet her? So I went to meet her. I um, came directly from the barn. I don't always dress like this when I'm assessing dogs, so <laughs> this is not a North American thing. So I thought I'd, I'd just try some dropping food in and just see how workable I thought she was. This is the next day. some really horrible wet food with peas and globs in it. It's not what I would have chosen, but it's what they have. That was a little bit cowboy of me. I should have dropped it from further away. Would have been better to have chicken that I could have thrown. But I love Doberman, so. <laughs> Terrible food. Don't use globby food. So this went on for a while, and, and watch what she's doing now. There it is. She's looking up before I get there. That's in one session. She's backing up and raising her head. She's not happy yet, but she's anticipating good things are going to happen. So do I take her home? Obviously. <laughs> So I had this dog for a number of weeks. And this is, I have many, many videos of Candy, but this is a, a shorter presentation. I had some friends over. She's quite comfortable with me. Notice when I bring the people in to generalize, they are not doing as much as I'm doing. We have a relationship. We're working up to touching. But what, watch her tail. She's, uh, Starting to get happy about me coming up. Oh, oh, it's mommy with the dessert. So I'm approaching from different angles. She's a dog I, I know quite well at this point, so I've dispensed with the tether and the second person. And now I'm being a cowboy, I'm touching her face and then adding the food to her bowl. But I'd gotten to happy on all of the stages. This is a number of weeks later. This dog, every meal she ate while she was with me, we did some version of this. So I'm just mixing it up now. I'm not, she, she's good with me with all of this. But this is our first session with new people. This is what happens when you go to visit the dog trainer. Like, I've got this Doberman. I didn't show them the before video. Would you mind just throwing food in her bowl? And my friend came over with another friend, so why not? I did not choose to free feed this dog because I had 
three or four other dogs at this point. But I did feed her a little bit more than it said on the um, on the bag. I wanted to make sure she was not hungry. She did gain some weight while she was with me. So um, I sent that video to the Doberman Rescue Group that I was working with and said, is she ready to go now? Because she was kind of barky. She wanted to go. And there we go. She went to this really nice lady who has a red Doberman and an original black and tan Doberman at home. So now she's got the trifecta. <laughs> and there were no reports of guarding in the new home. So yay for candy. So that's, your, that's pretty much straight classical conditioning with her. I didn't add in any, you need to do, so classical conditioning is just stuff happens. It's, it's not contingent on anything. So me approaching, predict, preserve. That's all I'm doing. She didn't have to sit. She didn't have to back up. She didn't have to shake a paw. She didn't have to look at me. She just, me approaching meant food. And for that dog, that was enough. This little guy was at an emergency shelter. He had bigger problems. Um, so we taught him a different approach. We had the same... Um, we did some classical stuff, but he would just hunker down even more. It wasn't working. We needed to start with getting him off the bowl. And unfortunately, the video has disappeared in the ether between LA and here. But we taught him to leave. We taught him to leave it. We taught him to back away from the bowl using body pressure. So what his protocol looked like was somebody approaches the bowl. You say, we said back. He backed up, he sat, we would pick up the bowl, we would add dessert to it, we would put it down and say, okay. So he had many steps that he had to do before he could get that bowl. And for that dog, the classical conditioning approach was, was not getting where we needed to go in that emergency shelter. Plus we had many trainers. So um, it's, uh, and he was one of the most fierce food guarders I have seen. He had to have his bowl pushed into his kennel with a broom at first. So he went to another shelter who continued the work and he also was adopted. So that was more extreme than most people would do. Teaching leave it is a really good thing for dogs who guard food as well as other stuff. If they've got a really strong response to you saying leave it, they spit out what they have, they back off from it, or if they're thinking about going to it, they back off from it. It's a super great um, response for them to have. So, oops, I do have time. Look at that. We're only at half an hour. We'll go a little bit into guarding things that aren't food. This dog, this was sent to me by a Facebook friend when I said, send me your resource guarding pictures. This is Nina's dog, and she only guards foster kittens. She's not guarding the food. She doesn't want the food. <laughs> she wants that other cat to go away from the foster kitten. I'm like, that's a weird one. I'm going to put that in. <laughs> but there, it just shows you there are a lot of things in the world to guard. This dog, that's the only thing she guarded. It's just a very specific, weird thing that could be managed. Clearly the cat is obeying. <laughs> but when we're going into things that affect the prognosis, Dogs who guard things other than food, to me, is a little tougher problem to work with. So here are the things that I want to look at. I want to look at how many triggers there are if they just guard food. And rawhides, well, rawhides are kind of food. That's kind of the same thing. I'm not so worried. But if they guard food and rawhides and non-edible toys like these and their bed and your lap and the piece of trash they found when wh that's what we call a fuzzy trigger it, it's shifting those dogs I have it's hard to work with how do you proof against deer legs <laughs> and thing, things that are shifting and I also look at bite inhibition if the dog is just making a lot of noise over lots of things and they they never ever ever put their teeth on you that may be something that's a little more workable or if they're that big and have no teeth. You know, you, you look at how much damage they can cause when you're assessing it. But for me, when I was a 
baby shelter trainer. I used to try to fix the gar dogs who guarded everything. And I found when I worked with Food and Toy and Chewy, I would send them home and they would guard a bed and come back and the owner's been bitten. They've been traumatized. The dog ends up to euthanize anyways, but I've traumatized an adopter. And he's sold two friends and they've told, like it's, it's bad for the shelter to send out a dog who's going to bite. It's, um, it's not just, the dog's gonna end up anyways euthanized, but traumatizing your adopters is, is never a good thing. So um, we put it, we had written treatment and criteria and we just put in there dogs who guard everything, dogs who have multiple shifting triggers. Let's just cut out the middleman. Let's be the, the, the strong people and not send them out. And that was at a shelter with lots and lots of resources and trainers. So in general, dogs who guard things that are not food, these two are just playing, but if this was likely to turn into a confrontation over a tennis ball, it's pretty easy to manage. If it's only tennis balls they are guarding, take the tennis balls <coughs> away. <laughs> this dog really is guarding all of his toys. We'll talk a little bit about how to work with dogs who only guard toys. One of the best cures for it is making the toy more fun when you give it back to you than it is to hover over. So that was a Border Collie. He will probably be relatively easy to train to retrieve. So you can, I'll show you what the two toy retrieve looks like next. You can also clicker train a dead retrieve. So you teach the dog to target the toy with their nose. They get a click and a treat, teach them to um, open their mouth when they target the toy and you can gradually shape them to pick the toy up, put it in your hand. It's um, a, a more advanced training technique, but if you've got good trainers at your shelter, that can be a way to work with these toy guarders. But my favorite quick and dirty shelter teaching dogs to retrieve trick is the two toy, toy retrieve. So basically the dog has their toy that they love and um, you make your toy more fun. So I'm not getting into a confrontation with him over that toy, I'm just showing him, my toy's way more fun than your toy. So I move it around, I shake it, I try, he'll usually, they'll usually take at least a few steps back to me and try to persuade me their toy's more fun. And if I'm persistent, um, as soon as they drop their toy, I say yes, I fire my second toy past their eyeball so they have to chase it. And then I pick up the second toy. So this, it's a great thing to teach dogs who don't guard toys as well. And that's what it looks like. So the second he dropped that, I said yes, through the, through the toy past his eyeballs. I prefer to have two toys that are exactly identical because there's always one that's slightly better. You can guess which one it is for this dog. <laughs> I also I also do this in a small room so that if they take the toy way down to the end of the yard I'm not having to walk all the way down if we start with just a, a short distance like that and they get into the rhythm of bring it back drop it bring it back drop it that can be really helpful this is a little dog problem. Those of you who came to my seminar will recognize my dear departed Minnie Rossi, who was a rabid lap garter. That's his favorite pet sitter. <laughs> and that's yet another poor Doberman putting his nose in the picture. So again, you have management. If the dog guards the lap, maybe you just don't let him on the lap. This one only guarded from other dogs. So maybe he just doesn't get, he certainly wouldn't get to be on my lap when the Dobermans were running around. But uh, that's his favorite pet sitter. You can also teach them off, just say off, throw the cookie, teach that when there's no, nothing around that they're going to guard and make it a fun thing for them to do. You can also teach the dog a send away, keep them out, get them to move 10 feet away if you need them to be further from you, if they're just leaning against you guarding, that can be a good one. 
And what I do with my lap guard is, is as soon as I see that face, they just get dumped off the lap, and that, that can work quite well too. Now for your adopters who complain that their dog is guarding stuff, this is the most valuable piece of information you can give them because they will be hearing from other trainers, they will be seeing on TV that they need to get confrontational with the dog and that makes very good television. It also makes normal people get bitten. So the concept of teaching the adopters to trade for something more valuable is a really, really big one. So um, I would use a treat a little more high value than this, but that's what I had for my pictures. And the trail of treats technique, I had a client whose dog got a whole loaf of bread and she success and he was guarding the whole room and the bread was spread everywhere and she was successfully got the dog to give up the bread by going to the fridge and getting something higher value and making a trail of cheese out of the room, shutting the door. And then once the dog is out of the room, you can safely clean it up. It's just so much safer than getting confrontational with the dog. So in conclusion, <laughs> food guarding can definitely, definitely be improved. If you're, if you're going to start a behavior modification program in your shelter, this is one of the best things to start doing. Think about outsmarting your dog rather than powering them of overpowering them. If you're adopting out dogs who are guarders of anything, make sure your adopters have that in their in their repertory that get out of it without confronting the dog. And I am not somebody whose main job is supporting shelters, but I love you guys. And if you if you have problems that you would need help with or if you would like to shoot me an email, this is my last talk. But that's my email, lower animal behavior, spell it the American way or it goes into the ether. And if you're implementing, especially if you're implementing any of the things that I've talked about and you need support, um, please shoot me an email. I'm, I'm really happy to help. I, I work in private behavior practice now, but shelters really have my heart. So thank you.